Lovely. Thank you so much, Dr. Jasmine, to be, uh, you know, to be a part of this show. And it is indeed a pleasure to always have you with us. Thank you so much, Karan. I'm so happy to be here with you again. Yes. And uh, before we kickstart today's discussion, Dr. Jasmine has graduated from Medical College, Amritsar, and now currently she's practicing internal medicine and preventive medicine in, based in Arizona and USA. Her focus is on lifestyle modification for healthy living, which includes diet, nutrition, and behavioral modification. She firmly believes that a good balanced diet, sound sleep, exercise, and our attitude towards life is key to preventing a lot of lifestyle and medical problems that a lot of people face. So with that note, let's begin today's session. And I want to very quickly jump into the first question, which is artificial sweeteners. And that is what the topic is for today, that hormonal imbalances and the role of artificial sweeteners. So Dr. Jasmine, uh, you know, recently I was reading an article which uh, you know, showed that in the last 50 years, the amount of sugar consumption, you know, which people do now, has gone up 30 times in the last 50 years, which means that 50 years back, if our grandfathers or grandparents, uh, you know, had sugar once a month, now we are having that same amount of sugar every single day, because there is a 30 times jump in the consumption of sugar. And the big problem is those artificial sweeteners and processed sweets and packet foods and all of that, which were not there 50 years back. So what are your thoughts on artificial sweeteners and their contribution to this epidemic of lifestyle diseases? So, you know, artificial sweeteners, um, you are right. We are getting, the, as a, overall, as in a whole world, we are, you know, people are getting more obese and the, the problem is our kids. You know, the kids are getting diabetes now and they are getting fatty liver. And the reason for that is the sugar consumption that we have either in a form of a real sugar or artificial sweeteners. The problem lies that we think that the artificial sweeteners are okay. Uh, once we start artificial sweeteners, we think we are good to go. But the problem is what we need to remember that sugar is an addiction. It is an addiction just like we get addicted to alcohol or smoking or drugs. And it, it, it is pretty hard to give it up. It takes a lot of willpower and determination. So what happens is then we start going towards artificial sweeteners as a substitute. But I don't know how many people really have tried artificial sweeteners, whether it comes to diabetes or weight loss, that they were successful with it. Because ultimately, few of the studies have shown that they actually cause obesity. They do lead on to, and second thing is they cause, um, it's, it, they further make you crave sweets. So once you're an artificial sweetness, you are going to crave, crave the sweets more. So it really doesn't help you overall uh, when it comes. And second thing is it's a chemical. Very well said. In fact, uh, addiction, that is one very, very important point that you have raised because scientifically proven, you know, uh, sugar is very highly addictive. And uh, that is why people keep craving those sweets and you just cannot have few of them, but they have a tendency to go back to that. So insulin is a hormone which is made in our body and insulin resistance is something which is created when we eat more packet foods and artificial sweeteners and more sugar and more bad fats. What are your thoughts on insulin resistance and its contribution to uh, hormonal imbalances? All right, insulin resistance is one of my favorite topics these days. But, uh, you know, when we think of it, that whenever we eat anything, we have a blood sugar that goes up in our body. And the insulin's main purpose is to keep that sugar under control. So every time we eat, what happens? Well, we secrete insulin to take care of that sugar. So it's not in our blood. It takes it away to the liver. Some of it is stored as glycogen to be used as energy right away when we need it, like when we are not eating, and the rest of it goes to the muscles to be stored for energy. So what happens is when we are constantly, either if we are constantly eating 
or we are eating food that makes more blood sugar in our body, for example, carbohydrates, they are going to make more carbs and more glucose in the urine, sorry, in the blood. And then comes the proteins. And in fact, the fat does not turn into blood sugar in our body. So it's always the carbohydrates or the sugar. And then come the proteins when we are eating that in high amounts. And then come the fat. So one thing is fat is not bad when it comes to blood sugar. Fat alone will not make your blood sugars go up. It is, but we don't eat fat on its own. We always eat fat with something else. And that is what's spiky. For example, if we eat bread, bread with butter, butter is not a problem when it comes to sugar. It's the bread that is a problem. So what happens is when the insulin is always constantly running high because I don't even let it go down to more than three hours before I eat again, and then I'm eating again. So the insulin is constantly running high in our body. So at some point, the liver cells are full of sugar because I've been constantly feeding myself. And then even the muscle cells get full of sugar and they cannot store anymore, especially if we are not very active. So then what happens is the, ins the cells kind of give up on insulin and they stop listening to insulin and they cannot store any more sugar. And that is what we call insulin resistance. That is our cells are not responding to insulin anymore. And that is the problem. And then that extra sugar, we, we don't know what to do with it now. The insulin doesn't know what to do with it. So it starts going to all the places where it doesn't belong, like in your kidneys or your heart or your nerves. And uh, that is, I'm pretty sure we all know somebody who is diabetic that they start getting numbness and tingling in their feet because of the sugar that has damaged our nerves now, or uh, they get the kidney damage from uh, exposure to this high amount of sugar all day long. Interesting. So insulin resistance is something which is linked to not just hormonal imbalance, but even, you know, we know aging is related to insulin resistance. You know, we have obesity and PCOS, thyroid, so many uh, lifestyle issues uh, have a common cause, which is insulin resistance. Would you throw some light on, uh, you know, common hormonal issues and, and how, how uh, you know, artificial sweetener and insulin resistance have caused these hormone issues and what is the way out of this? What is the solution? Because, yes, we understand that avoiding packet foods, avoiding junk foods is important. But uh, is there anything else that we can do about apart from that? So you know, when for example, when you are having a, an if uh, when you when you check your sugars, right? Well, let's say you are diabetic and you are checking your sugars at home, um, you will notice that if you have a sugar uh, artificial sweetener, your sugars are not going to spike because artificial sweeteners do not make your sugar sugar spike in the blood. So you feel good about it. You feel, oh my God, my sugars are perfect. But the problem is it is still causing insulin to spike. And there's a difference between insulin and sugar. So right. it is kind of a false uh, happiness you can get out of it that my sugars were fine, but the, your insulin, because of the taste receptor, it's still sweet. So when we eat those taste receptors in the mouth, they still end up secreting your insulin, which again is a problem and it can cause the weight gain and fat storage. So that is, and of course, the cortisol levels go up. The growth, when insulin is high, your growth hormone goes down. It's the opposite. So when the growth hormone goes down, there's no repair of our cells. And then the cells endothelial level, the blood vessels, uh, they don't get repaired. And that is when the inflammation and the whole problem of cardiovascular problems and the heart attacks and the strokes and the inflammation starts. So it causes a lot of problem. And the next question you said was, how do we get out of it? What do we do? Yeah. And I think one of the most important things for people to remember is that insulin starts working very hard for us. It really works very hard for us to keep our blood sugars within normal limits. But at some point it gives up. It just cannot do anymore for us. And that is what we call insulin resistance. So this process starts at least 10 years before we actually develop diabetes and we are actually diagnosed with diabetes, you know, when the sugars are really high because insulin doesn't know what to do anymore. And we go to the doctor and the doctor checks our sugar, it's high, right? And that's when we think we got, but 
guess what? You started developing diabetes 10 years before you actually got diagnosed because insulin was making sure that your sugars are not high before this. So when you get that, when you, when your doctor tells you that your A1C is high, you know, like A1C is on average how your sugars are for the last three months. And many times I tell you, you know, your sugar's a little high, be careful. That is the time to get very aggressive and get your sugars down so you do not get to the point when you actually get diagnosed because by that time it's always already been 10 years and a lot of damage has already been done it's too late in other words so Very how true. do we in fact i would just want you to pause here for a second and the test in fact one of the very very important tests that uh, you know we had studied was fasting insulin you know uh, I don't know how is it in US, do people check it regularly because in, in India, the culture of or rather the awareness of testing fasting insulin is generally not that high, right? And I think fasting insulin is a one test which can actually tell us if our, uh, you know, insulin is high, which can lead to insulin resistance. What are your thoughts on that? You're right, we are, you know, it again here also, um, it is not being checked, but I do check on my patients on a regular basis now because I believe in that. I believe that if insulin is high, you can point it out to the patients. Do something now before your sugars go up. High insulin is a warning sign that you are going to develop diabetes 10 years down the road uh, right. or maybe earlier, depending upon your sugar. So do something about it now before it gets to that point. And the second reason, uh, way, uh, and do ask your doctors to order that. Like Karan said, it's very important. Um, the second thing is like, let's say if uh, you don't know what your insulin is, what, how else can you know that you may be insulin resistant? And other ways to know if you're insulin resistant is if uh, when, you go, uh, when you get your cholesterol checked and your triglycerides are high, which is again, um, triglycerides go up with your sugar and it goes up with the carb intake. Right. So if you notice that your triglycerides are high and your HDL, one of the um, components of the lipid panel that is low, or if you have uh, you are putting all the fat in your belly, uh, so you may be thin on your arms and legs, but if you have all the fat accumulated in your belly, that is insulin resistance. And third is uh, your like your hypertension, uh, all those um, things. Fatty liver. Many times uh, you will be told that your liver function tests are slightly elevated. Your fatty liver. So all these things put to, together, what we call metabolic syndrome, they are pointing towards insulin resistance. So if you feel you have any of these things, ask your doctor to check your insulin, even if you have not been diagnosed with diabetes yet, especially watch the kids uh, very closely because um, the way it is going these days, we are seeing um, kids as early as the age of 30 being diagnosed with the cirrhosis of the liver and the fatty liver which is pretty serious. Alarming. Very, very alarming. In fact, that's a very, very, uh, a couple of great information for all the listeners. There is a test known as fasting insulin, right? And fasting insulin is a simple blood test, which tells us whether our body has high amount of insulin. Now, we see this in a lot of people, you know, if you get diabetes, that if today you get diagnosed with diabetes, you know, seven, eight years in your body, there will be high level of insulin right? Just generally people don't check. So if your family history is of diabetes or metabolic syndrome or lifestyle diseases, you might be checking your sugar levels, which are coming normal. But we also advise that once a year, twice a year, keep checking your fasting insulin, which is also a good test as your pre, it is like your pre-diabetes, all right? And if fasting insulin is high, which means that maybe a few years down the line, your sugars level will start going up in the test. So that is number one. Second is the combination of high triglycerides and low HDL. High triglycerides and low HDL is also a sign of insulin resistance, right? Which all of us should understand. And number three, what she mentioned was in men, if there is a fat in the belly, and if women, there is a fat around the hip side, these are also the signs of insulin resistance because that is where the insulin is stored. And insulin is a fat storage hormone. There are so many people who come and say that they're not able to lose belly fat. And primarily, the reason is there is extra insulin in the body, which needs to be managed and reduced with the help of right protein and right plant foods 
and complex carbs and not refined carbs and good fats like pumpkin seeds, chia seeds and all of those things. Now, uh, Dr. Jasmine going to the food part and, uh, you know, trying to reverse uh, hormonal imbalances with the help of lifestyle modification. Uh, what are your recommendations which listeners can do? Uh, four or five recommendations to reverse hormonal imbalances with the help of lifestyle changes. All right. It's the same um, thing, Karan, that we hear almost every day. My suggestion is go sit down with your grandparents and ask them, how did they eat? And that's what we need to go back to. When there was a real food, uh, we, uh, we used to eat vegetables, uh, fruits, and there was no nothing called processed foods. Very rare, right? And even the bread, I know it has a bad name, but the bread, if you're eating in moderation once or twice a week, it's not bad. The problem is that all the flour that has been literally stripped of all the nutrition that, are we, that we are using today, and we are getting more used to cakes and cookies and those things, I think the first thing I say is get rid of the snacking. So yeah. your body is getting a rest, like in old good days, we used to eat uh, three meals a day and there was not much snacking. But now if you look at that, we could be sitting on the, our computers and snacking on something or the other. It doesn't yeah. matter what, we are still snacking. And when we are snacking, we are secreting that insulin and insulin doesn't know what to do because I'm sitting in front of the computer for 10 hours a day yeah. and that say, it goes on to becoming a fat in my body, right? In, so in fact, getting... today, in fact, today I had a patient who, who said that in office, he has a habit of munching biscuits. Biscuits yeah. is mega, flour, refined flour, sugar, all of that. And then he said within one or two days, I finished a packet of biscuits. That is something which people should be aware of that those packet foods and processed foods does more damage than what we believe. So whenever you eat next time, think that was this food given to me by nature uh, or was it made in the factory and has a label on it? So if it is made in any factory, don't eat it. I know we all have to indulge once in a while into this good stuff. But keep it under control, maybe once or twice a month. Do not bring these things at home. Go outside, enjoy a nice dessert, come back, and then go back to the things that we should be eating, which is all right. whole foods. Even fruit juices, they are full of sugar. There's nothing you're getting out of that fruit juice other than sugar, uh, putting a lot of sugar. Second thing, the fruits. You know, fruits, uh, they are good for us, but try to, especially if you're trying to, if your sugars are running high or if you are trying to lose weight, then do limit the sugar, uh, the fruits to once or twice, uh, at least once a day, no more than that, because the sugars do have a lot of sugar. Fruits have a lot of sugar in it. That's a problem. It's a fructose. And the problem with the fructose is that, you know, like how um, when we eat bread or rice, they, it has got glucose in it. And glucose is a starch. Glucose is used by our body, by every single cell in our body. To be, you, it gets used as energy. So it goes to the liver. If you're eating glucose, like in the form of uh, food, uh, your vegetables or your uh, rice or bread, again, be in moderation. Then that is going to be utilized as energy. When you're eating fructose, and what are the common um, sources of fructose? Fruit, too much of fruit, high fructose corn syrup, which is again, a lot of it is being used in the processed food these days. And they right. will call it sugar-free or uh, you know, the, those kind of words, which, uh, which is absolutely not true. And fructose is not used by our body for any chemical reaction. So basically the liver doesn't know what to do with all this fructose that we are putting in. Like for example, our table sugar, sugar that we use in our tea or coffee every day, it has one molecule of glucose and one of fructose. Glucose, mm -hmm. fine, we can still do something about it. We can use it. Fructose, we don't know what to do with it. And that ultimately the liver doesn't know what to do with it. And it gets stored as fat. Right. So the moment you see any processed food with the word fructose, uh, put it away. Don't use it. Um, so those and then fasting. You know, again, wh why fasting? Because when you're fasting, you have minimum sixteen hours to eighteen hours to twenty hours, and slowly go up to twenty, you know, thirty hours or how, however you can do it. You are not secreting any insulin at that time at all. And when you are not secreting insulin, your in 
you are going to start using your own energy that you stored in a form of a fat. And that's what we are looking for. I think this is a very, very important point, And I want to highlight this to all the listeners. One simple way to you know, reduce insulin in your body or to reduce that belly fat or, or that fat is insulin uh, you know, or, or reverse insulin resistance is intermittent fasting. And we see this in so many people that early dinner, so you finish your dinner by 7, 7.30 and maybe start at say 9 o'clock, 9.30, which is just a 14 hour intermittent fasting. But doing a minimum 14 hour intermittent fasting can really help, you know, reflecting those things. So, you know, intermittent fasting is when you finish your dinner early, don't eat anything for 14, 15 hours and start after 14, 15 hours in the morning. Intermittent fasting helps a lot in reducing hormonal imbalances. Intermittent fasting helps a lot in reducing that extra fat because when you're not eating, your body is using that fat and converting that into energy, which is very, very important. So many of our diabetes patients do 15, 16 hours intermittent fasting and they see excellent results. So intermittent fasting is a very, very common solution that we see across a lot of patients who wants to, uh, you know, reverse uh, insulin resistance. Now, so that was very well uh, pointed out. Now, uh, there's one question from the listener, Maduji, is how about an apple a day with a pear or papaya or pomegranate? Uh, is that a lot of fructose or that is fine? So there is, um, again, you know, if you're, it depends upon your goal. Like, let's say if somebody sugars are really running high, maybe give up on fruit for a month till your sugar's under control and then do one fruit a day. And the way to remember, and, and again, if you're trying to lose weight and you have 20, 30 pounds to lose, maybe give up fruit for a month and lose weight and see how you do. The second thing is that sweeter the fruit is, for example, take a, a banana. You know, when the banana is a little green, it has less sugar in it. When it is more ripe, and of course we all like ripe bananas, that is the one that is full of sugar, right? right? So there is a, what we call a glycemic index. Glycemic right. index is, you know, if you search it, is a, it is available on the internet and it is gonna tell you that what fruit is high in glycemic index, what's low. And one easy way to remember, the sweeter the fruit is, like for example, pineapple, grapes, mangoes, all these foods that are more sweeter, they're going to have more sugar in it. So those are the ones you absolutely do want to cut down on. And if the fruit is not too sweet, like for example, apple or uh, your berries, um, citrus fruits like oranges, they are not too sweet. So, but again, limited, limited down to one to two a day. You don't want to make a smoothie of the different type of fruits because you will realize, because we all think, you know, fruits are good and that's how we have been told fruits are good. But too much of fruits is sugar. It's a, a nature when, you know, um, the God was taking care of us, he made sure we get a dessert and fruit should be considered like a dessert that we don't eat too much of it. Also, another way to answer, uh, just to add to what she's saying, Maduji, what we also recommend is to add uh, maybe seeds with the fruit, right? So maybe if you're having an apple or a nashpati, a pear or a pomegranate, try and have one or two teaspoons of chia seeds or pumpkin seeds because seeds are good quality fats. And when you eat good quality fats, your insulin and sugar doesn't rise at all. So it really binds uh, with your fruit very, very well. And we see a lot of people when they combine a couple of fruits with uh, good chia seeds and you know, good omega-3 fats, it really doesn't help sugar or fructose to rise. So that is also one input. Uh, you know, can we drink water during intermittent fasting, Ritu Bajaj? Yes, we can drink water. Uh, during intermittent fasting, but then again, there are a lot of people who do dry fasting, but uh, water is fine as far as if you're maintaining intermittent fasting. Uh, moving to uh, last question, uh, Dr. Jasmine, to you, in terms of uh, hormonal uh, imbalances and, and things like that, uh, you know, we spoke about artificial sweeteners and you spoke about those, uh, you know, those juices, that artificial juices like apple juice and lychee juice, those tetra pack juices which are available now and uh, it is purely sugar. You know, I mean, there's no apple in the apple juice, but more of a sugar in that. You also mentioned about high fructose corn syrup, right? Which is a bad form of uh, fructose. I mean, you know, corn flakes, for example, 
has conflicts has lot of conflicts has lot of high fructose corn syrup which is a bad form of sugar so many children eat corn flakes thinking that it is good for us but we now know that corn flakes can you know also you know uh, worsen your sugar levels and it also adds to your fatty liver and lot of things like that so uh, dr jasmine my last question to you is to all the viewers now that they have understood eat more real foods more plant foods avoid those processed foods which are made in a factory and not that nature has given us i want you to tell all of us four uh, you know simple messages that they can apply in their life right you know from tomorrow four things that you think you know be sleep is walking or intermittent fasting whatever four simple lifestyle changes that you want all of them to apply so that they can start uh, reversing their hormonal imbalances or belly fat or things like that i think keep it simple because uh, one of the things is and we all have we all have the basic knowledge right i mean uh, that what needs to be happening and what doesn't what we need to avoid but the most important question is then why do we struggle with that you know i know that mithai is bad for me but if i come home and i see it on the kitchen counter no one's stopping me right i mean right. and i think the big reason is because we are not focused on changing our habits and mental uh, behavioral modification is the most important thing because if i'm not focused and i'm sitting and i'm reading about weight loss i'm really trying to learn what is right for me but at the same time if i'm eating and munching on something it's really defeating the purpose so next time uh, it is not easy you know it is not easy to give up our habits so next time when you are going to pick something take your 20 seconds to think through why you doing what you're doing pay more attention to your behavior and the second most important thing is that write down all your symptoms today before you start making a change because many times what we do we focus on a weight right food is equal to weight for a lot of us so but write down that do you have headaches do you have skin problems do you have uh, joint pains gi symptoms and after every two weeks as you are making these changes especially with fasting see what your symptoms are and i can tell you you will notice a change in your symptoms you'll be sleeping better you your skin issues are going to go away a lot of patients with psoriasis if they um they would tell you that they um, the psoriasis got better or your their skin looks better which itself i think is a big deal for all of us um so those changes and how do you get used to intermittent fasting take it slow if you're already used to fasting great you know and if you're saying that okay i'm, I'm fasting for 24 hours i'm not seeing a change then what should i do it's not working for me then go to you know 30 extend it go to 36 hours of fasting and maybe start doing fasting instead of once a week fast every other day and try one time you uh, what they call one meal a day try to have your meal on the lunch time and maybe next time uh, around dinner time because you want to keep your body confused change your these habits of eating every few weeks because you you don't want your body to get used to the fact okay because then it's going to think that the only time we eat is a lunch time so automatically it goes into the mode of storing the fat because oh my god maybe something is wrong she was eating four times a day and now it's down to one time a day and automatically my body is going to think that i need to store all that extra fat so it's not going to help me so sure. making a change is possible what do you eat during intermittent fasting like karan said water is absolutely fine you can have uh, apple cider vinegar lemon uh, make sure if you're doing extended fasting that you take care of your salt so put lemon salt pepper anything you like in your water as long as it is not an artificial sweetener artificial sweetener in the tea is absolutely going to take not of uh, intermittent fasting don't use honey Uh, all these natural sugars they are going to make your sugars go up they are not going to make you lose weight and the amount of uh, uh, that we use in a um, is actually doesn't give us any nutritional value anyways so always th- uh, those are the ways and go up um, if you are not used to fasting then maybe if you're eating your breakfast right now at 8, 8 a.m go to 9 it will take you two weeks to get used to that then go to 10 and what they call time restricted eating that is eat your whatever you want to eat in a day eat it within 5 hours 
And then rest of the time, let your body take rest and heal. Is green tea, green tea. Uh, Karan, I'm just seeing a question. Yeah, green tea is absolutely good. There's a tea that comes in. It's called matcha tea, M-A-C-H-A. -A. So that is absolutely fine during uh, when you are fasting. Even, for example, I absolutely am not the types personally who can have uh, black tea or coffee. So I, when I'm, um, I use a little bit of uh, two tablespoons of heavy whipping cream in my uh, coffee. And cream, guys, is fine. It's uh, it's not bad. It is not fat. That, that is why Karan said earlier that use the seeds with your uh, when you're eating fruit because the fat slows our digestion. Whenever you're eating something, if you add a little bit of fat in it, it is going to slow your digestion and you are not going to see those spikes. I don't know how, I, do you have the availability of um, uh, glucose monitoring, the continuous glucose monitorings? Not easily, uh, not easily. Very limited people do that, yes. Okay. Because so, that is one way to know what your, yes, how you, yes. everybody's different. You know, for example, I may not spike my sugars uh, with the particular food, but somebody next to you may do the same. So don't go with what the other person is doing. You could be doing it entirely different. Right. What are your thoughts on stevia? Uh, you know, artificial sweeteners like stevia. Uh, st out of all the artificial sweeteners, stevia is supposed to be uh, better, okay. um, especially if you're using it in the form of drops. You know, if you're going to use stevia, whenever you're buying these things, always make sure they're, uh, especially um, that they're organic. Uh, they have that, that they have been certified by somebody because a lot of these things are not, uh, at least here, they're not FDA, nobody regulates them. And they you, you don't know what's in them. So make sure that you're buying the right thing, first of all. Second thing, when you buy stevia, stevia, you can buy in the packets, you can buy in the form of drops. Sometimes they do have other sugars added to that. And you're not going to know that because many times if you notice artificial sweeteners, you cannot come to know what artificial sweetener is in that particular food because they don't, they put the codes like numbers on it. And every number is equal to some type of artificial sweetener. So uh, that's the problem. So if you have to use stevia, use the drops and you need maybe one to two drops of stevia and that's fine. If you have to use it and you absolutely cannot live without that sweet taste. Understood, but you're saying that drops is better in terms of stevia. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you use Good. only maybe one or two. You don't use more than that. Understood. Uh, you know, very quickly to summarize uh, four lifestyle modifications, Dr. Jasmine, from your side for them to start following. So one I can clearly understand is intermittent fasting. You know, if they're not in used to it, they can start with 12, 13, 14 hours. So that is one intermittent fasting. Another three, uh, what do you recommend for uh, modification lifestyle changes? Lifestyle changes, sleep is extremely important. Keep yeah, your stress yeah. down. And if you're getting good sleep and you will notice the day uh, you don't get a good night's sleep, what is the next thing we do? We all look for a comfort food. It's the way our brain makes us feel better. So, yes. um, so pay attention to that. Go, for, you know, when we talk about exercise, if you cannot go to the gym, uh, that's okay. Stay active at home. Do your laundry. Do your cleaning. You know, as yes. be as active as you can be. Go go for a walk, because exercise does not help us to lose weight. It helps us to maintain the weight. Mm -hmm. Exercise has a lot of beneficial. It really benefits. But when if you're looking that you're going to go and I exercise for half an hour every day on the treadmill, I haven't lost weight. You're not going to lose weight unless you have changed your diet with it. So 80% is your diet and then 10% or 20% is your exercise. So that is, I think, very important. Uh, somebody had just put a question in, Karan, that um, the, when, the fr you know, talking about when I eat fruits, my sugars. Yeah. When, we are, when we are checking our um, finger sticks, for example, what are we checking? We are checking our blood sugar, right? Glucose. It checks the glucose. Right. Right. And so when you're eating fruit and just a pure fruit, you are, uh, it's fructose. It is not right. glucose. So f or sugar, for example, if I put a tablespoon of sugar, it's, a f it's most of it is fructose, 50%, right? Or high, 
So that is not what is being checked on your, uh, when we are checking a finger stick. So your sugars can be not, maybe not go high. Whereas when we are eating chapati or roti, uh, the glucose, uh, it is glucose. So of right. your glucose content is what is being checked by your, uh, at home and right. it is going to spike. And second thing is, uh, which I think Karan knows much more better than I do, that if you're eating rice, um, basmati rice, the long grain rice has a less glycemic index. Mm -hmm. So it is going to make your sugars go up slowly as compared to the rice that are uh, short. So those mm -hmm. minor changes can also go a long way because I don't know if any one of us can live without our rice and chapatis. We shouldn't <laughs> have to, uh, but okay. as long as we keep it within limits, that's what matters. Absolutely. And sleep, as you rightly highlighted, is also very, very important because we see so many people who are depriving themselves of good quality sleep. In fact, a couple of days back, I was speaking to a patient, 19-year-old girl suffering with weight issues and other hormonal issues. And every day she was sleeping at three o'clock. Now, no matter what she eats, if she doesn't fix her sleep uh, quality and sleep time, you know, her weight is not going to go down easily. So sleep is one thing which is very, very vital when it comes to hormonal balance, when it comes to overall good health and immunity. So with that note, thank you so much once again, Dr. Jasmine, for being a part of today's uh, show. And it was lovely to interact with you. Thank you once again, Dr. Jasmine, for being a part of this. Thanks, Karan. And thank you to everyone for listening to us. And if you have any questions, do let us know and we will try to answer them back for you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you once again, all the listeners. And uh, next Friday, we have Dr. Puama, who is an oncologist, and we will be an oncologist from Bangalore, and we will be discussing about food and cancer. So see you all uh, next Friday. And uh, till then, uh, have good habits, stay happy, sleep on time. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye.